Good morning. Quick question for you. I've, I've, I've come over the course of time to realize that uh, families speak in code a lot uh, because you're around each other. My, my family tends to speak in movie quotes. Um, but there are certain words uh, that I grew up using that um, a lot of people don't know. So I'm, I'm going to ask, does anybody know what slew foot is? What? No, that's not what it is. I'm asking you. Slew foot. Slew foot? Slew foot. S L E W foot. It was a horse. Was a horse, yeah. It's also a, a devious kind of uh, not very nice thing. Thaddeus, where did he go? <laughs> Come here, Satch. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> okay. Turn around. Okay, a slew foot is when you do something. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hurt yourself when you fall. <laughs> when you come up and you do something like this to trip someone, or when they're walking, take a step, other foot. <laughs> you kick the feet out from under them. Okay, go sit down. <laughs> My mom used to refer to Satan as slew foot. Okay, because. He has these ways of coming up and tripping us. He attacks us from angles we don't see, we don't expect. Sometimes when we're really thick, he attacks us the same way over and over and over again and we just don't learn, okay? Um, I want to encourage you today. You have a very real enemy that is seeking to trip you up, that is seeking you harm, that is doing everything he can to separate you from the love of God, okay? Now we know nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, but sometimes it's hard to feel, isn't it? I want to pray a blessing over you guys because I, I know um, <laughs> we all have flaws. I have flaws. I know that's a surprise. <laughs> uh, I, I, I sometimes get frustrated with myself because it seems like I traverse from flaw to flaw to flaw to flaw to flaw. Um, and, you know, this week, uh, Christy and I had a, 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 a not very good day um, because we don't speak the same language. We use the same words but they obviously don't have the same meaning to each of us. And uh, we had some miscommunication and, and uh, emotions got involved and, and we had a day where we, uh, it just wasn't a good day. And then later on in the evening we, we came back together and um, she was able to explain what she meant, which meant I, hope, I wasted the whole day being angry at her because what she intended to say and what she meant was not what I heard and what I received. And I want to encourage you today. You have an intercessor. You have a defender. You have somebody who has your well-being in mind. He's not going to put you a trial except that he's going to go there with you. Okay? Um, so, so today, I want you to be blessed because when Jesus left, he said it was for our benefit that he left. Because when he left, the Holy Spirit would come. All right? So let the Holy Spirit work in you. Let him iron out those wrinkles. Let him deal with those flaws. Be a willing patient, not an unwilling patient. Because he's going to get them one way or the other. All right? So I have a, a couple of Ask the Pastor questions. Um, I'm only going to answer one today. <coughs> The uh, person that wrote this obviously has never been to brothers' meeting. The question is, <clears throat> what does turn the other cheek mean? Please give today's world examples. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew. We're going to put this in context. <laughs> so 
So this, this passage comes out of Matthew chapter 5. So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, the particular verse, uh, I'm going to read a little before and a little after so we understand it in context. Um, what verse? I will tell you as soon as we, yes. You're looking for a gold star. Um, we, we're going to start off in, uh, let's go with 36. Okay, verse 36. And then I'm going to read down through the end of the chapter. Um, this is Jesus speaking. This is the, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and he says, And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black or come back. <laughs> Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone should sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers... What more are you doing than the others? You did, uh, do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I want to kind of explain a little bit about the Sermon on the Mount. Because uh, earlier in the passage... <clears throat> Jesus talks about the law. Okay, uh, he's intro with the Beatitudes, and then he talks. I just want to read this passage so you understand what I'm going to say. Uh, this is verse 17 uh, and following. It says, "Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them." For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if we take that passage and we just leave it on its own, it makes it sound like um, we should be under the law, right? Okay. If Jesus said, I, I didn't come to abolish the law. You know, um, as a matter of fact, we, we read in, in some of the epistles from Paul, um, what Jesus actually did was he came and gave us a greater law. Uh, in some passages, he calls it the law of the Spirit. Uh, other passages, he calls it the law of Christ. Um, he, what Jesus is doing here is he is revealing to us the very nature of our sin. Okay, And if you read down through these things, uh, you'll see that uh, Jesus takes some of the commandments, do not commit murder. Thus far, I've never done it. I've never killed anyone. To my knowledge, I've never killed anyone. Okay? Um, but Jesus takes the action, and he actually places the sin 
prior to the action because he says, if you hate your brother, you've committed the sin. If you look lustfully at a woman, you've committed the sin because sin at its root is a heart issue. Okay? There are a lot of times, especially when I was driving in traffic in Houston, that I could have murdered lots of people, um, you know, uh, people that make an effort to get in front of me so they can drive slow. <laughs> in my flesh, they're worthy of at least a beating. Okay? Um, and then, you know, so I, I moved to Montana to get rid of the traffic, and here they drive tractors. <laughs> That's right. No, but, but you see, the thing is that Christ is revealing to us something higher, something greater than what we had up to this point. He's revealing to us that it's not whether or not you commit the action that separates you from God. It's, it's what you are thinking, what is, is inside of you, what you're doing with things. Okay? And so he goes down. And he, he talks about these different sins, and he reclassifies sin. He takes it from action, and he elevates it to thinking. To that place in our soul where we dwell, those things that we ponder on. Okay? And then he comes down, and, and he talks about divorce, and he, he talks about oaths. That's where we picked up a little bit later. Uh, and then he comes down to, uh, does anybody have a, a subtitle right above verse 38? What's that? Go the second mile. Go the second mile. Does anybody else have it? Retaliation. Love your enemy. Yeah. Night for night. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I don't like this question. I don't like it because, like I said, if you've been to Brothers Meeting, this passage has come up several times. And we have a lot of different interpretations of this passage. Okay? Um, all scripture is to be read in light of all scripture. You don't just take a passage and build your theology off of a passage. You look at it in light of all of scripture. When you look at it in light of all scripture, everything flows. And when things don't flow, you got to go back and, and try and figure out where you messed up, because it's not the word that messed up, okay? Um, the literal translation, and, and I don't have the Greek word, I apologize. Um, I got antihistamine stuck in my head because it's something to the effect, uh, it's something like antihistamine. Um, if, if you look down in uh, verse 39, do not resist the one who is evil. That word, that translation is almost as close to the original as you can get it. Okay, don't resist them. Now, here's the dilemma. Um, if we take this right here, it's very easy to preach pacifism. Okay? Um, and, and I believe in a very great measure we are to be pacifists, okay? But the dilemma is there are other passages that talk about defending the weak, defending the fatherless, protecting the widows. It talks about something that would require an action on our part, okay? Now, I personally, I struggle with this passage. I do. Um, I grew up in a very physical family. Um, we loved each other hard. We hit each other harder. Um, we, things were resolved very quickly. With, with four boys in the house, it, they could re resolve explosively, but it was typically done quickly. Um, I struggle with the idea that if somebody were to come after mine, my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, um, there's an ugly part of me that still goes back to that pre-Christ era where um, I, I could hurt somebody fairly easily. Um, now, 
I struggle with this because I, I, I can't find a reason to go beyond defense. Okay? Uh, somebody breaks into my house and they're threatening my wife and my children or my grandchildren. I will preach the word as I'm shooting. <laughs> But I struggle with it because I'm not sure that allows me that. Okay. What I know this forbids is to retaliate against someone. It doesn't say anything about defending yourself. But it does say don't get them back. Okay. What does that look like in today's world? Well, remember the guy and all of his cousins that cut me off in Houston? I'm not allowed to zip around them and get in front of them and, and slow down. Okay? Uh, I'm not allowed to, the guy cuts me off and, and gives me the one finger salute. I'm not supposed to retaliate with the one finger salute times two. Uh, I, I'm not supposed to be at that point where I, you know, I drive up and they're talking on their phone and they got one hand on the phone and the other hand on their makeup and I'm not supposed to pull up next to them and say what I would like to say I don't retaliate. Now, he gives us some very specific examples here. Okay? The first one is our person. And he says, if anyone slapped you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. As near as I can tell, we only have two cheeks. So, you get me once, you get me twice, but I'm not allowed to retaliate. This is our physical person. This is our being. Okay. Um, it's kind of like the uh, castle law: defend your ground, stand your ground. Um, if somebody comes into your house and threatens your family, you can shoot them. But if they exit your house and run away, you can't chase them down the road and shoot them. Okay. Um, so we see there's a physical aspect to this. Uh, but then there's a possession. If somebody sues you to take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. Okay. This one, I think, speaks hugely to us in America because we love our things. We, oh, um, we, uh, we are very possessive in nature. And it's hard for us to let certain things go. Um, as a believer, I don't believe our possessions should ever influence us. Okay? Um, I, I think we have a greater possession in eternity than anything we'll have here on earth. Uh, and then we go to the third one, which is your time. Okay? As he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, I have not seen any writer of antiquity that talked about this, but I've heard over and over again that uh, this speaks specifically to one of the rules that the Romans had over any country that they governed. A soldier could require you to carry his pack for up to one mile. Okay. And after that, he was responsible to carry it or find somebody else. And if, if uh, Jesus speaking here, he says, you know, don't just go with him one. Go two. Now, in each of these situations, what is Jesus trying to get us to reflect? Love for your neighbor? Be like him. Yeah. Wow. To, to be like him and loving not just our neighbor, but as we read later, our enemies. Okay? Now that's hard. That's hard. Because when I see people that do things, um, especially against the innocent, I get angry. I don't want to love them. I... I, 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 I but that's what I'm supposed to do. Because see, in, in my sin... God looked at me and saw my ugly. And he made a way for me to not be ugly. And my hope should always be 
that they might in some way <coughs> receive the revelation that I did so that they wouldn't be ugly. Okay. So what I believe is going on here is that Christ is calling us first to a higher law that far supersedes anything that Moses gave us. Okay. Second, he's calling us to be like him. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the pacifistic view. Um, if you ever want to hear a, a very lively debate, uh, go to brother's meeting. Okay? That's one of the things that, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Uh, you can't sharpen iron without sparks. Okay? Uh, and, and I think we've got such an incredible group of men here that we can have a difference of opinion and still be in fellowship, okay? So, um, answers up here with more of the passages of scripture that I referred to. Um, 